Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Elizabeth Gilbert is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Big Magic, Eat, Pray, Love, and several other internationally bestselling books of fiction and nonfiction. Her latest, entitled City of Girls, is a unique love story set in the New York City theater world during the 1940s. A novel of glamour, sex, and adventure, it's about a young woman discovering that you don't have to be a good girl to be a good person. Here's our own Amy Brinker in conversation with Elizabeth Gilbert. Thank you so much for doing this. This is the nicest thing. I'm so excited. Oh, honey, you're so welcome. It's my pleasure. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah. Um, I'm in Pennsylvania with my family, so things are a little bit nicer than my teensy tiny studio apartment. Yeah. 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 I, not exactly what your plan was for the year, though, right? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> Definitely 2020 was supposed to be the year of like, like independence yeah. and fun. But <laughs> the day you were like, you know what I can't wait for this year? I can't wait to move back in with my family for months and months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely the um, feeling like a 15-year-old again was not on uh-huh. the docket, but <laughs> how are you doing today? I'm great, sweetheart. <laughs> um, well, I just want again, thank you so much. I'm so, so pleased to have you and um, not to fangirl, but I, I brought Signature of All Things home with me and it was like such a balm and such a like delight oh, to have. So. <laughs> sweet. <laughs> um, Pleasure. Yeah. And so I figured today we were just going to like have a little chat about um, just like what you've been doing, how you've been thinking. um, And I think um, one thing you put on your Instagram, you did a great story about just kind of all the pressure around um, feeling like you need to produce or feeling like people need to be creative at this moment, which is like not (laughs) not anything anybody needs right now. Um, And so I just wanted to kind of explore some of those ideas, too. So. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll go wherever wherever you direct me. Awesome. <laughs> okay. um, great. Well, I guess um, one thing to just start is you had a wonderful interview in the cut a while ago about your morning routine, which was like very delightful to me. <laughs> the idea of dancing every morning is very sweet. Um, has that changed? Have you do you continue your meditation practice? Do you continue dancing? Has that just been a constant for you in this time? It has been. You know what? It's so funny. Never more than ever, I think for me, and and this is not speaking to what anybody else should be doing or needs to be doing, but I've just learned the hard way through my life that the more stressful and unsettled the outside circumstances are, the more important it is for me to keep to a routine. Right. <laughs> um, you know, I just don't do, I'm like a three-year-old. I just, I think we kind of all are. Like, I don't do well when my routine is jarred. I don't do well when my sleep is jarred. I don't do well when my eating is, you know, I just don't. I get temper tantrumy and cranky um, and and I fall apart and everything seems to be too hard. And so, yeah, it's it's actually been a godsend that all of those practices were already in place because I feel like, um, I feel like I'm really actually beginning to understand what particularly spiritual practices are for um of like especially like meditation and centering prayer and journaling and all that stuff it's it's building the ark before the flood um, you know? <laughs> so like on a normal day on a normal mundane day you know what are you doing that for like what is what is your 30 minutes of meditation really about it's just your day is nothing but then a pandemic hits, you know, <laughs> or there's a death in the family, or you you lose your job, or a, a marriage ends. You know, there's all these things that where where all of a sudden the world doesn't feel mundane anymore. It feels like it's raining hammers, mm-hmm. and then you've got this boat that you've built for yourself of these steady practices that can that, that create like a th- a through line of continue of, of like a continual sense of routine and a continual sense of connection to source. Um, so yeah, long answer, but yes, all of those things I'm still doing this morning. I, I already did my meditating, my prayers, my, um, I haven't danced yet today, but I will. And I, um, uh, and I have also added to it that I've started drawing in my journals. So I don't just write my journals now. I do little sketches and drawings, um, which sedates me almost as well as Xanax. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's a great, I love that so much. Um, there have been, there have been some of my favorite artists on, on Instagram have been doing corn zines, which I love. Oh, cute. <laughs> I like it. Clever. <laughs> Um, and you just, you had a great, uh, video on your Instagram. I was mentioning just about, um, uh, making, cre not making creative output, another chore or another thing that you must do, but leaning on it as a bomb and leaning on it as like a, a stabilizer. Um, and I was thinking about people who are not used to being creative or haven't had the time to be creative or, you know, have felt a lot of shame or just blockages about that. Um, and bringing it back to childhood, um, just starting to doodle or trying to like put out something small. Um, can you recommend like how somebody would just begin? Like, what does it mean to express yourself if you're not used to that? Yeah. Well, first of all, I would suggest that you do a little bit of thinking and you try to remember what you used to do when you were around the age of nine that you really liked doing. <laughs> like, what were you into? Cause that is, a really big key to the answer. Um, and I was really, really into drawing when I was a kid. And then I stopped because other people were better. You know, I stopped because my sister was really talented and I could see that I wasn't. And, um, and I just, there's this, there's this bifurcating thing that, that sort of starts happening around that age where a lot of us can point to how old we were when we last did each one of the creative, the sort of common human creative ventures. So a lot of people could tell you the last time they sang, the last time they drew, the last time they danced, the last time they made up a story, um, the last time they like cut and pasted things, you know, um, not on a computer, but with scissors and paste. <laughs> um, like a lot of people can point to it. And usually if you, if you walk back the cat, to try to figure out what happened right before you stopped. It was usually a moment of shame. Yeah. Um, um, somebody said that you had a bad voice. Somebody said that you were a stupid dancer or somebody, you know, whatever the thing was. But up until you, up until somebody informed you that you needed to be ashamed of it, you really liked doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of a good idea to, like they say in animal tracking, when you lost the trail, you go back to the last time the trail was hot. So when was the last time you actually did see a mountain lion? Like go back to that spot, you know, so return to that. So for, for when was the last time the trail was hot for you? Because all kids do creative things. Um, but there was a point at which you, you stopped doing it. So see if you can figure out when that was, see if you can figure out why that was. And most importantly, see if you can figure out what it was that you were doing before you got shamed mm -hmm. and then do it again. Yeah. Um, one thing, one thing that I'm doing, and, and I would also recommend, um, Barry, she wrote a book called Syllabus, um, something, Linda Berry, Linda Berry, who is also a MacArthur Genius a grant, grant winner because she should be. And she does, she, look into Linda Berry. She spends a lot of time teaching art to people who haven't made art since they were kids. And it's incredibly liberating. One of the things she pointed out is that if you haven't drawn a picture since you were eight or nine years old, when you draw your first picture, it's going to look like an eight or nine year old <laughs> because you actually are going to pick up exactly where you left off. And um, so I have a, a notebook full of sketches that look like a third grader did it because that's kind of the last time I was ever drawing. But I've actually gone online and I've purchased anthologies of the best anthologies, compendiums and treasuries of children's book illustrations. And then I just copy them. <laughs> That's <laughs> because, great. Yeah, children's book illustrations tend to be really simple, like a duckling in the water, you know? And um, so I just sit and listen to podcasts or if I'm on a meeting that's a little bit boring, I'll have one of those books open and I'll just try to copy it. Yeah. Um, and, and also just recommending that, you know, that you understand that no one but you ever needs to see this. <laughs> right, right. Um, and so I don't expect myself to be a great visual artist. I just remember that when I was a really hyped up anxious kid drawing and coloring made me feel relaxed i would also suggest coloring because it's the easiest somebody yeah. else already drew um so so just get really like don't I, oh i also recently ordered i haven't gotten it yet but i recently ordered a book of arts and crafts for grade school kids um and i'm going to start doing them because that's my that's my skill level so yeah. <laughs> i love paper mache it's yeah. like what? like totally like give me something to like to cut out and make like a crown cool yeah. i'll figure out how to do it so um so do the same kind of crafts that you would do with a child but do them with yourself yeah. um i my most recent like joyful like crafting experience was like drawing 
meticulously drawing like little tiny uh, dishes of chicken because it's my friend's best favorite food is chicken and then pasting them onto a recipe box. And that was like sheer joy. So I think the advice One to like fully commit to hundred. something kind of silly. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's so wonderful. I love that. And you know, like, here's the thing that I'm realizing about creativity and it's important. So, so one of the things I started when I put that post up on, on Instagram that you're referencing, I started off by saying, you don't have to do any of this, you know, um, you know, especially if you're on the front lines of this, of this virus and of this pandemic and of this crisis. And by front lines, I don't just mean healthcare workers. I mean, if you're a parent with young children at home, you're on the front lines, right. you know, um, if you're in a, in, if you're hold up with people who you don't like and can't get away from, you're on the front lines. Yeah. If you just lost your job, you're on the front lines. Like there's massive numbers of ways that this is affecting people in really hard ways. And so if I come to you and be like, you should be doing crafts, with you know, time, right. Yeah. <laughs> you have the right to punch in the face. Anybody who says that, um, like here's another thing that you should be doing or anybody who's trying to craft shame you, um, yeah. like don't allow <laughs> Craft shaming. This is a new one. It's, so like, don't let it happen. But that all of that said, I will say that, that there is something about creating something with your hands that is incredibly neurologically relaxing. Um, and, and that what tends to happen in people's lives in the trajectory of a human life is that we all instinctively know that when we're kids. And, and this is why human beings spend so much time creating in indigenous societies, why people are always painting and weaving. It's not, it's not just practical. It's also, it's medicinal, you know, it's also really, really soothing to do it. Um, what generally happens in our culture is that first, a few people get sig um, singled out as being talented and stars and then all the resources go into them. And then everyone else is like, hold, you're not a creative person, which is yeah. why you hear people say, I don't have a creative bone in my body, which is insane because we are the creative species. Yeah. Um, but the second thing that happens is that our culture has created shortcuts to way, things that we can do to not feel our anxiety um, that are quicker and they're also profitable um, for other people. So shopping um, and stimulants and sedatives and alcohol and drugs and nicotine and you know all of these substances and activities that we do usually starting around adolescence are a way to hotwire our nervous system so that we feel good um sex is another one that we discover often and so you'll so what happens is that you become an adolescent and you find these other ways to do it um and that's great they actually do deliver a hit but they also deliver a pretty severe consequence on your pocketbook on your body on your self-esteem i know a friend of mine who's in 12-step in recovery says if it's not a man it's a martini if it's not a martini it's a muffin if it's not a muffin it's a mastercard you know there's always something that we can and reach for it to make us feel good. But what I'm really interested in right now in my life is the difference between doing things that feel good and doing things that make me feel well. That's right. You know, yeah. so doing things that make me feel good, like impulse buying makes me feel good for a minute. Like a, a martini makes me feel good. There are certain things that you can do, but making creative creative work makes me feel well. Yeah. And by well, I mean the quiet hum of well being, like the steady vanilla kind of like I can breathe I can I haven't thought about my problems in 10 minutes I'm sort of like that so and all the meditation practices and the dancing and the journaling and the praying and all that that I do every day I do it because it makes me feel well and and the more I can feel well the more I can sustain and 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 survive life on earth especially right now I think it's also so much about focus. Like the, you never, I personally, I, I find that like fo meditation is just such a struggle because it's just focusing and just paying attention. And with, with creating anything, it is just focused attention. And that, that is such a gift and that is such a, like, um, difficult to find and difficult to, to decide to do too. Um, yeah. And you've been trained and you've been, you know, really, 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 really smart people have sat in really expensive high rises or out in Silicon Valley for many, many years figuring out how to exploit that. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and you know, you're not a victim. I mean, we're not victims, but we're like, we've really been used as experiments in right. attention. Yeah. And, um, and it's not really our fault, but, but there is a way to take it back. Yeah. 
Yeah, but what, like, you know, what a beautiful thing to decide to give something your full attention and yeah. whether that's something is something you're creating. Like, it's yeah. kind of amazing. Yeah, um, if it's drawings of chickens on a recipe box, awesome. <laughs> Um, one thing that stuck with me from, I think Big Magic it was in, was um, talking about following your curiosity rather than being like, oh, I have this grand idea. You just followed mm -hmm. your curiosity until you learned more about botany and learned more about gardening and wrote signature of all things. Um, one thing that I've heard of people doing now during COVID is that people are just giving their friends little PowerPoint presentations about something they're just really interested in. Which oh, is like the cutest. Idea. Isn't that adorable? I love it so much. Um, and like, obviously, you don't have to be an expert. Obviously, you don't have to, be, you know, know everything about it. But it's just something you're interested in. Um, is there? What would you give your presentation on if I asked you to give me like wow. a ten minute presentation right now? <laughs> <laughs> I would give a presentation on um, a practice that I have that I love to teach to people of how to learn how to speak to yourself lovingly. Um, and, and it's a journaling practice that I created 20, I didn't create it, I would say like, I was, I was given it <laughs> by, by uh, the universe or something, it, it was a gift. Um, uh, 20 years ago when I was going through um, my, my first divorce and a really horrible depression and, and period of, of, of great unhappiness, I was so lonely and I was so longing for, you know, I was so longing to be held and so longing to be reassured and, and longing to be um, just having somebody give devoted care to me. And there was nobody to do that. And so I remember waking up in the middle of the night one night and pulling out my journal and deciding to write to myself as if I were the most loving person in the entire world communicating with me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, wrote all that it's not hard to do all you have to do is write down everything you wish somebody else would say to you <laughs> like yeah. everything like if you could design like the perfect partner or the perfect friend or the perfect mother um who what would they say to you right now and then you would just write that um and you say it to you and um and it always starts with and i've done it now for 20 years and i reach out to that voice whenever i'm troubled and my journaling practice every day is it, it's me reaching out to that voice of love. So I will start my journal every day with the same three words, which is, I need you. And the very next three words come from love itself saying, I'm right here. And then I say whatever I'm troubled about, whatever I'm worried about, whoever I'm pissed off about. And then love just listens, you know, and then love responds as true love would um, by generally speaking, not giving advice, which is a really good thing to know. True love doesn't give advice. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> so when you, when you find yourself, I, my, one of my favorite spiritual teachers, Byron Katie says, advice giving is always driven by panic, by the panic of the person giving the advice. But like, true, yeah, true, true love doesn't give advice. True love just says, what, what love says to me, if I say like, you know, when, when the COVID thing started and I said, I'm really, really frightened and I don't know what, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and, and my, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried for my family members who are vulnerable and I don't know what's going to happen to the world and all these people. And, and she just listens. I always think of it as a she and she, and she just says, um, I see that. But normally the first thing she'll say is, I see that. I can see that you're really upset and I want you to know that I'm right here with you and I've got you and I'm not going to not going to let go of you and you can't lose me. So everything else can be lost. You can lose your job. You can lose um, people in your life might die. You can lose your stability. The country can lose. The Republic can collapse, like all sorts of things. The, the, the financial markets can be gone, but I'll be with you for the whole thing. So whatever, wherever you end up, you'll know that I will also be there in the same way that I have always been there. And, and it's just this incredibly calming, reassuring voice um, that just says, I've got you, I'm with you, you can't lose me, um, and you're never alone. Um, because those are the things, generally speaking, those are the things we all want to hear. We want to hear somebody say, I've got you, you can't lose me, you can't do anything wrong. And whenever I feel like I've failed or I've made a mashup of something, love always says to me, I'm the relationship you can't lose. You know, um, like the others can come and go, but, but I, I was with you before this person came into your life. I will be with you after they leave. You know, mm -hmm. everybody else can come and go. I was with you at the moment of your birth. Um, and you can't do anything wrong as far as I'm concerned. You can't do anything that will make me go away. 
can't. Um, and I think of this great teacher, um, Ram Das, the great spiritual teacher, Ram Das, and his spiritual teacher, he said of him, there was nothing I could do to convince Maharaji of my own corruption. He always, always, always thought that I was worthy of being loved. And, it, and I know, and that's the voice that I, that's the voice that I call on. There's my voice of love knows everything I've ever done, <laughs> knows all my horrible, evil thoughts, knows everything. And she still just, I can't convince her of my own corruption. She just constantly just says, I've got you. I love you. And she calls me sweetheart and honey. And, and the really cool thing about this practice is that um, it's so easy to access because like I said, all you have to do is, is write down the thing you wish somebody else would say. Um, but it's, and we all know what we wish that is. Um, but it's also what's happened over the years, my 20 years of doing this is one that I've changed the way I speak to myself internally because that voice has now become my internal voice. So I don't have the terrorist living in my head anymore telling me that I'm history's greatest monster, which I had forever. Um, and the other thing is when I'm with people who are acting out or falling apart, I actually know how to be with them because I've learned how to be with myself when I'm acting out and falling mm -hmm. apart. Um, so that is what I would do my 10 minute. That's, I think I just did my 10 minute seminar. <laughs> I love it though. That's so actionable and so accessible to everybody. That's wonderful. I mean, like it's hard. I mean, it would be hard for many, for many, but the step is there. The step is easy to take. That's wonderful. Oh, yeah. Um, let me see. I wanted to ask you very quickly about um, City of Girls is now in trade paperback, which is very exciting. And um, right now, uh, I think a lot of people are like with our like digital insights and consumer insights data or whatever, like, the most unsurprising thing in the world is like people would love a feel good read right now. <laughs> so, um, so that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you among many, many. Um, but can you just, just tell me a little bit about what escapism in art means to you right now? And like with yeah. anything that's helping you escape right now too? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm actually reading a book called um, The Essex Serpent. Oh, I think that's so good. I want to read yeah. that. Yeah. And I'm escaping into that. That's that's a perfect escapism book for me because it's um, you know, good 19th century, um, strong female character who's really into science. Um, and she's trying to figure out the origins of this myth in this small uh river village in Essex that there's a that there's a water monster that there's a serpent and it seems to be coming back and it's haunting people's dreams and I don't it's it's kind of supernatural plus scientific um and it's delightful and uh so I know look I think people have always used the arts as a place to be able to take a vacation from themselves and the world um and it, and I put it in that order because um the more important the more important gift of being able to escape into art is to be able to take a vacation from yourself. Um, Cause you can, you can shut the door, you know, and get away from the world. <laughs> you can turn off the news and get away from the world. You can't, there's nowhere to go to get away from your own mind. Um, and so humans have generously over the centuries and over the millennia used their creativity to make things that are so literally captivating that you get captivated into them and then you have a lovely little holiday from having to think about yourself <laughs> <laughs> and that is the use of escapism and that's totally what city of girls is like i i unapologetically and and with a great sense of celebration wrote and created and put that book into the world as pure escapism um and and for me it was i wrote that book in the aftermath of my partner's death I wanted to escape my my own mind for a few hours a day and write about a glittering, fresh, giddy moment in history, New York City in 1940, showgirls, dancers, playboys, the theater world. And it worked for me. Like yeah. the months that I spent working on that book, every time I would dip into that world, I would get to have a, a vacation from my own grief and my own sorrow. And so I can I can honestly say the first person I tested City of Girls out on to see if um, <laughs> if it worked as escapism was myself. <laughs> so it's good to um, me. <laughs> yeah, and so I can say like it worked for me. It might work for you. Go ahead and give it a try. So there's a, I, I wanted to write a book that went down like a champagne cocktail, and um, it does. and that 
what I hope that it will do for others. I gave it to my friend who just finished her PhD on uh, justice and inequality. And she's like, I can't do anything in my life right oh, now. So. God. Oh, her poor mind. Yeah, so she was, it was a breath of fresh air for her too. So um, great. I think that I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but the, thank you so much for doing this. This is such a thrill for me. And I really, really You're appreciate so it. You're so welcome, sweetheart. And, and good luck with your quarantine. And thank good you. luck to everybody with theirs. Um, you know, the, the, I keep saying to people, uh, this, this will end, um, this virus will end, but not before it's had its way with us. <laughs> God. And it's going to have its way with us emotionally, spiritually. It's going to do it. It's like, it's got its own agenda. But once that's over, um, you know, just get through it and we're all, we're all going to end up okay. So, I know. so uh, lots of love to you, sweetheart. Take care. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. And now, here's an exclusive excerpt from the audiobook, courtesy of Penguin Random House Audio. In the summer of 1940, when I was 19 years old and an idiot, my parents sent me to live with my Aunt Peg, who owned a theater company in New York City. I had recently been excused from Vassar College on account of never having attended classes and thereby failing every single one of my freshman exams. I was not quite as dumb as my grades made me look, but apparently it really doesn't help if you don't study. Looking back on it now, I cannot fully recall what I'd been doing with my time during those many hours that I ought to have spent in class, but, knowing me, I suppose I was terribly preoccupied with my appearance. I do remember that I was trying to master a reverse role that year, a hairstyling technique that, while infinitely important to me and also quite challenging, was not very Vassar. I'd never found my place at Vassar, although there were places to be found there. All different types of girls and cliques existed at the school, but none of them stirred my curiosity, nor did I see myself reflected in any of them. There were political revolutionaries at Vassar that year, wearing their serious black trousers and discussing their opinions on international foment, but I wasn't interested in international foment. I'm still not. Although I did take notice of the black trousers, which I found intriguingly chic, but only if the pockets didn't bulge. And there were girls at Vassar who were bold academic explorers, destined to become doctors and lawyers long before many women did that sort of thing. I should have been interested in them, but I wasn't. I couldn't tell any of them apart, for one thing. They all wore the same shapeless wool skirts that looked as though they'd been constructed out of old sweaters, and that just made my spirits low. It's not like Vassar was completely devoid of glamour. There were some sentimental, doe-eyed medievalists who were quite pretty, and some artistic girls with long and self-important hair, and some high-bred socialite types with profiles like Italian greyhounds, but I didn't befriend any of them. Maybe it's because I sensed that everybody at this school was smarter than me. This was not entirely youthful paranoia. I uphold to this day that everybody there was smarter than me. To be honest, I didn't understand what I was doing at college, aside from fulfilling a destiny whose purpose nobody had bothered explaining to me. From earliest childhood, I'd been told that I would attend Vassar, but nobody had told me why. What was it all for? What was I meant to get out of it, exactly? And why was I living in this cabbagey little dormitory room with an earnest future social reformer? I was so fed up with learning by that time, anyhow. I'd already studied for years at the Emma Willard School for Girls in Troy, New York, with its brilliant all-female faculty of seven sisters graduates. And wasn't that enough? I'd been at boarding school since I was 12 years old, and maybe I felt that I had done my time. How many more books does a person need to read in order to prove that she can read a book? I already knew who Charlemagne was, so leave me alone, is how I saw it. Also, not long into my doomed freshman year at Vassar, I had discovered a bar in Poughkeepsie that offered cheap beer and live jazz deep into the night. I'd figured out a way to sneak off campus to patronize this bar, my cunning escape plan involving an unlocked lavatory window and a hidden bicycle. Believe me, I was the bane of the housewarden. 
thereby making it difficult for me to absorb Latin conjugations first thing in the morning, because I was usually hung over. There were other obstacles as well. I had all those cigarettes to smoke, for instance. In short, I was busy. Therefore, out of a class of 362 bright young Vassar women, I ended up ranked at 361, a fact that caused my father to remark in horror, Dear God, what was that other girl doing? Contracting polio, as it turned out, the poor thing. So Vassar sent me home, fair enough, and kindly requested that I not return. My mother had no idea what to do with me. We didn't have the closest relationship, even under the best of circumstances. She was a keen horsewoman, and given that I was neither a horse nor fascinated by horses, we'd never had much to talk about. Now I'd embarrassed her so severely with my failure that she could scarcely stand the sight of me. In contrast to me, my mother had performed quite well at Vassar College, thank you very much. Class of 1915, history and French. Her legacy, as well as her generous yearly donations, had secured my admission to that hallowed institution. And now look at me. Whenever she passed me in the hallways of our house, she would nod at me like a career diplomat, polite but chilly. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.